Hi, good evening everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Sophia Lemos, I'm the Curator of Public Programs here at the Contemporary. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you tonight to our contemporary conversation this season, Form and Frontier. Uh, it's good to see some familiar faces here and also new ones. So thank you everyone. Um, so in addition to convening this gathering, I have the great pleasure to thank our speakers, Iman Issa and Colleen Wright, for being with us tonight and who I look forward to introducing in a short moment. This extends to showing our gratitude to the University of Nottingham and Nottingham Trent University for generously and graciously supporting our events, as well as acknowledging my colleagues Ryan, Craig, Jim, Karen and Catherine who are supporting us this afternoon. Some housekeeping notes. This event is expected to last approximately two hours. Each presentation this evening is followed by, uh, pardon, by five minutes of direct questions and an extended Q&A at the end. Our fire exits are located at either side of the room and toilets outside in the lobby. In the foreseen event of evacuation, our colleagues will indicate the nearest emergency exit. As with all events here at the Contemporary, today's discussion is free to access, but all donations are greatly appreciated to help support future free events. If you're feeling generous this evening, and if you can, please donate. Lastly, I'd like us to take us this moment to silence our mobile phones and bring our awareness to this space. So I'll read just a short introduction to the evening, and then sort of introduce our speakers um, and begin the conversation. So, uh, in 1938, the Museum of, Mon of Modern Art in New York issued a press release informing that it would open, quote, what will be probably considered the most unusual, exhi uh, unusual exhibition, and certainly one of the largest. The exhibition was Bauhaus 19, 1928, an expensive survey dedicated to the influential German school. On display were nearly 700 examples of the school's output, including works of textile, glass, wood, canvas, metal, and paper. It was a celebration of the curriculum and legacy of the Bauhaus during Walter Gropius' tenure as a director. Of course, there were three more, two more directors before the school closures in 1933. The size and scope of this tribute indicated the importance of the Bauhaus to the, moment, to the development of MoMA. The school had served as a model for the museum's multi-departmental structure and inspired this multidisciplinary presentation of photography, architecture, painting, graphic design, and theater. The exhibition coincides with a larger inquiry placed by MoMA between 38 and 69, which was the series What is Modern? Through books, touring exhibitions, and a symposium. A version of What is Modern Architecture, opened in 1938, advanced the projection of the international style architecture, with its emphasis on volume, lightweight materials, and no ornament. Attendance to the exhibition averaged 400 people a day. In the previous year, MoMA hosted the exhibition Modern English Architecture, 1937, which included a newly commissioned film, The New Architecture of the London Zoo, by Laszlo Moholinaji, that is on view in the galleries upstairs. This short but precise episode from MoMA's exhibition history demonstrates how debate about the multifaceted and global nature of modernism was downplayed in detriment of a single view. Throughout the next three decades, debates about modern architecture excluded modernism as a limited, non-linear and fractured movement and the relevance of modernist ideology for Western capitalist development. The end of MoMA's inquiry on what is modern coincides with the, 19, with the 1968 presentation of Bauhaus in Britain at the Royal Academy of the Arts in London. Initiated by the Federal Republic of Germany, 50 years Bauhaus toured internationally. The displays were designed by Maxwell Frey and presented a wide array of works by Bauhaus students and masters, uh, with Gropius himself attending the opening and delivering a speech focused on Bauhaus' long-lasting impact on art education. The exhibition attracted more than 75,000 people. This short episode serves to narrate and to kind of put together a question that we'll, we'll carry on throughout this evening. On what basis is it possible to construct a canon and to construct and to narrate a canon? Um, the critique and deconstruction of the modern canon has since shaped both artistic practice and theory. 
as researchers Christine Currie and Hasha Salti contend, the canon is not only an instrument of institutional power, but also a means to create a form of literacy and historical consciousness. This evening dialogue is concerned with, the canonic, with this canonical narrative. Taking at his point of departure the exhibition Still and Dead, Popular Culture in Britain Beyond the Bauhaus, the evening explores the broader subjective conditions in the reception of Western modernism, or pardon, uh, explores the broader subjective conditions in which the reception of Western modernism persists optimistically as a formula to this day. This inquiry is part of a season of public programs that explores the global trajectories of Bauhaus modernism and narratives that speak from and beyond the canon of modern art, architecture, and design. It is our pleasure then to welcome Inman Issa, an artist currently based in New York and in Berlin. Her work is driven by an intense interest in history and her insistence in questioning the preconceptions that govern knowledge. Recent solo and group exhibitions include the Whitney Museum of, Modern, uh, of American Art, Hamburger Bahnhof in Berlin, uh, the MoMA in New York, the Solomon Guggenheim Museum, uh, the 21 uh, House Vienna, Marco Barcelona, among others. Issa taught at the Cooper Union School in New York between 2012 and 2017, and since 2014 has been the member of the curriculum committee at the Home, Space, at the home Workspace program in Beirut. She's currently a guest professor at the Hochschule für Kunst in Bremen. Colin Wright is the director of the Center for Critical Theory and associate professor in critical theory at the University, at the University of Nottingham. His research interests include psychoanalysis, French critical theory, continental philosophy, and the intersections between post-colonial and political theory. His teaching approaches the present through the changing role of critique in today's society. Wright has published extensively in international academic journals and is the author of three monographs and two co-edited volumes. He's currently working on two book projects exploring the relationship between Lacanian psychoanalysis and health, as well as technology and the digital unconscious. Finally, this conversation is part of a larger inquiry on modernism throughout the season, expanding on the exhibition Still and Dead, Popular Culture in Britain, Beyond the Bauhaus. We invite you to share your program, your thoughts and questions, both here with us today and on social media at NC Public Programs. Save the date for our forthcoming events, including uh, the Autolith Group in conversation about their new film, O Horizon, commissioned by Bauhaus Imaginista, and the International Conference Architecture of Education in partnership with EFLUX Architecture and Kingston University, as well as the launch of our new Independent Studies Program campus on October 24th. Without further ado, I'd like to invite you to uh, join me in warmly welcoming our speakers. Thank you. So I'll start. Yeah, this is working. Uh, so thank you, Sophia, for this uh, introduction and for the invitation to be here. Uh, and thank you to Colin for um, being here as well and uh, to all of you for um, coming out tonight. Um, I thought um, it, it, we don't have enough time, of course, for me to pre present a, a comprehensive view of my work or, um, or also um, a particular thesis, but what I thought I would do is uh, run through um, some projects and try to draw a connection uh, between them and um, extract some threads um, that hopefully can um, can um, offer a platform on which to uh, to build a larger conversation. Um, and um, I thought I would uh, speak about uh, the works in terms of my intentions and also the process that was involved in them. So, of course, it's not the only way to speak about work, but I thought it would be uh, the most generative way to, um, to do it tonight. Uh, to give you a bit of background, I was born in Cairo and I uh, started out studying philosophy and political science. Um, and then at one point I uh, switched to an art degree and I spent um, um, most of my life until 2004 in Cairo and then in 2004 I moved to the States and in 2005 I moved to New York where I stayed there until about two years ago when I went to Berlin uh, for a residency and has been um, there ever since. Um, and um, maybe the earliest work that I would still look at um, today would date back to 2001. So that kind of gives you a sense of... Uh, um, so I thought I'd start around 2006, 
uh, with just uh, one work, which uh, is a video. It's a film. Uh, it's titled Skyline, which I won't show, but I just wanted to, uh, you know, bring some stills from it as an example, uh, because one of the things before um, I moved to New York, when I was living in Cairo, one of the questions that I was thinking a lot about was this question of how does one evoke a personal relationship to familiar figures, events, and places, and this question didn't seem to me like it would be very easy to answer, like it, it wasn't self-evident. Um, of course, when you move from your home city into a, a foreign city or a different city, this question became uh, even bigger in my head, and I became almost um, obsessed with it. And uh, moving to New York, I did what most people do when they move to a new city. You kind of walk around, you kind of try to familiarize yourself with the city, you try to find the spots that um, uh, that you like and, and to kind of build a relationship with the spaces around you. Um, and also another way that I, um, uh, I uh, follow in order to uh, learn about a city is to photograph it. So this is something I usually do. Uh, so I was doing this when I moved to New York. And uh, something started to happen where I felt that I was coming across familiar spaces that I'd never been to them before, but they struck me as familiar. So I started to document them, and uh, I thought, and they were mostly things happening uh, in time. So, you know, I'd be sitting, the sun would hit a building in a certain angle, and all of a sudden the scene would seem familiar, or I'd be sitting, there's a fountain against the modernist backdrop, and the scene would seem familiar. So I started to document these scenes, and I put them together in a film, which is the title Skyline. Um, it's, a, it's a single channel film, but I just pulled up uh, three stills from it. Because what was funny about it is, uh, you know, going around uh, videographing these um, spaces, thinking I have a personal relationship to them. And the film itself, when you look at the images in it, they look extremely generic. So they look like the images you would, uh, when you want to describe a city in the most abstract and, and general sense, um, these, these struck me as, as the kind of images you would use. So that was a bit unsettling. Um, and it, it made me come up with this idea that perhaps what I was recognizing in these spaces was not the, the presence of a familiar element, but rather the absence of a distinguishing detail that actually there was something about this emptiness is what uh, allowed me to photograph these spaces to begin with. Um, I decided to follow this um, idea and to treat these spaces as if they lacked something and to try to introduce an element that would bring them into a moment of definition or at least raise the question of how does one bring an image of a space into uh, a moment of definition. So I embarked on another project in 2007, 2008, which was titled uh, Making Places, where I started to uh, introduce, um, to take these photographs and introduce in them this figure uh, using an object. And uh, there, it's a series of 10 uh, photographs, and I titled each um, uh, photograph with whatever object the figure was using. So this one is titled Ball. This is vase, flashlight, megaphone, balloon. This is laser pointer, and there's a small red dot on the. Um, this is smoking can and flashlight. This is hula hoop and bucket, um, and mirror. Um, so this, um, this, I finished the series in 2008. Um, and, um, you know, speaking to people about it, but also there were some texts written on the work. Um, it, almost everyone I spoke to about the work uh, seemed to have a very different idea about what the work is than what I was interested in, in that, of course, the work itself became, like if someone described it, it was described as a documentation of actions in urban space, or the relationship of the figure to urban space in the most general sense. And of course, this had nothing to do with why I was um, uh, photographing these spaces, because I was more interested in this idea of specificity, like what makes a space specific, and how to introduce this um, element of specificity. So it became very clear to me that um, this 
this project was important to do in order to understand something, but that I didn't actually succeed in, in uh, figuring out what I was trying to find out, which is this idea of what makes um, an image of a space uh, specific. Uh, so I decided to do something else. Um, this is, uh, then I did a project in 2009. And uh, this one, I decided that perhaps, you know, if, if, I, if I'm not able to kind of extract this uh, specificity uh, in these spaces by, let's say, objective in quotation marks, by objective means, then maybe I would do something uh, else. I would delve deeper. Like, what if I went to my memories and personal associations and, and used them as a way to kind of extract what I thought was uh, specific about these um, spaces? So I did this. Um, I started with an image uh, of a space I had encountered, which struck me as familiar. And then based on this, I went back to my studio and I constructed a setting uh, based on the memories and associations that this space evoked. And of course, memory can have many forms. It could be a smell, it could be a taste, but uh, I decided to go with settings. So I, I, um, I made these settings in my studio and, and uh, produced photographs out of them. So you're looking now at a photograph um, of this setting. Uh, so this is another image of a space I identified as familiar um, and the setting based on the memories and associations it evoked. Another space. And the setting. And one thing I should say about the, uh, these settings, I always pick this image because it's a good example and it reminds me about uh, the process. Like, uh, even though they were images that were based on memory, I tried to be as rigorous as possible. And what I mean by that is that I would see an image of a typewriter in my mind, but it would be a specific typewriter, you know, a specific model. I would go down the streets in New York, I would start to look for this uh, model. Sometimes it took months until I found it, but as soon as I find, uh, find it, I, know, I knew exactly, of course, but I also knew where to place it in the image. So, uh, you know, making these photographs was both uh, quite difficult and also quite uh, easy. Um, having said that, um, now looking, even though, and this was the case for all the elements, so it was also a spoon, a table, you know, the, the, the cloth of the table, a cup, a pen, a pencil, everything was very specific. But looking at the images I, I was producing, I didn't necessarily feel that they evoked something familiar. So there became again this doubt of what, what these um, images were referencing. Um, I decided to continue anyway with what I was doing, but then at one point I decided I needed to do something else. So I decided to introduce a third element to, to each, um, let's say it was a diptych to make it a triptych. And uh, for this third element, I decided to go back to the image I produced based on memory and to look at it at, in a removed way. So pretend as if it was found or produced by someone else and use it as a point of departure for making uh, a third artwork. So this is what I did, like this is an example. I went back to the image um, of the setting constructed based on memories and I um, extracted the concept out of it which had nothing to do with my memories. I think in this case, um, I came up with two words like, um, or two terms like procession or military parade. And then based on that, I, uh, I made a work. In this case, it was a sculpture, a wooden sculpture with a red tape uh, stretched across it. And then this is how I displayed the series. So you see the, the first image of the space that struck me as familiar is, is small and directly pasted on the wall. The photograph based on memory is framed and it's, uh, it's larger. And then the third element, which took different forms uh, in each um, triptych, uh, was, was um, placed next to it. Um, and this, uh, this is quite... Um, an important uh, project for me because it helped me identify, I think, something which um, until today I'm still grappling with, which is this uh, kind of double bind where I feel that, um, you know, memory uh, and personal associations um, 
become available as the only means to achieve something, in this case to kind of extract this idea of specificity. At the same time, I am, uh, because I'm after a form of communication, I always feel a bit uncomfortable with using uh, memory and personal association. Because, you know, with memory, like if I tell you this um, glass reminds me of my parents' house, what will you say? I mean, you have to agree with me. Um, the, the forms are not ones you can argue with. And this was not something I'm interested in because I, I like this idea of, of presenting forms that someone else can argue with and not just accept. Um, so this feeling that memory is the only is the only way to go, but at the same time being uncomfortable with using it um, became kind of a dynamic that, um, that uh, is, you know, that's something I'm still uh, struggling with. But because of this, um, around 2010, I decided to look at uh, monuments and memorials. And I think for me, monuments and memorials became quite interesting because they had this uh, double thing. Um, because, you know, if you think about it like a person or um, in monuments and memorials, what you have is you have a person or a group of people who take it upon themselves to offer um, a personal vision, but it's for collective use. And because you have this kind of outside figure, event, history, uh, the forms are ones you can argue with, even though one can say the, the method of arriving at them is still, is still um, uh, quite located in a, in a subject. Um, so I started to look at monuments and memorials that uh, commemorated figures, events, places that I knew something about, so that I knew the history of, that uh, I knew something about the subject matter I, um, I grew up learning about or I grew up around. And uh, looking at these um, monuments and memorials, um, I asked myself if the forms uh, seem to evoke the figures, events, and places in an adequate manner, in a manner that I recognized. If that was the case, then great. If not, then I attempted my own uh, sort of alternative form. And this was a, a project which lasted between 2010 and 2012, where I um, made 10 displays, and each display was presented as um, an alternative form to, or a proposal for an alternative form to an existing uh, monument uh, or memorial. Uh, the project is titled Material, and uh, it's composed of um, uh, displays where you have a, a proposed new form along with the description of the original monument. And it was very clear to me that um, you know, sometimes saying the name of a figure or the date of an event is the least adequate way to actually recall this figure uh, or this event. So the way I recalled the original monuments was through this vinyl text, which I wrote in my own language and which relied mostly on general terms. <clears throat> so this is an example. This is a proposal uh, for, um, uh, uh, I'm sorry, a material for a sculpture proposed as an alternative to a monument that has become an embarrassment to its people, and you have this table-like structure with the two lights. One lights as one light shines, the other uh, fades. Uh, this is material for a sculpture. <coughs> um, sorry. Um, I just wanted to check something. Yeah. Uh, okay, this is material for sculpture acting as a testament to both a nation's pioneering development and continuing decline. Uh, and when I was doing these, I also wanted to take the language of monuments quite seriously. So I identified uh, these two aspects. One of them is symbolism, the other is abstraction as being very uh, prevalent when, uh, when one speaks, uh, when it comes to the language mostly used by monuments and memorials. So I, I wanted to employ this. So here you have the diagonal. You don't know if something is going up or going down. Uh, one sound that was coming out of the speakers was meant to recall uh, development. The other sound was meant to uh, recall uh, decline. This is material for a sculpture commemorating the victory of what initially appeared to be an inferior army. And you have this uh, table-like structure with legs. Um, they're kind of similar to the legs you would see in a military museum holding a missile. Uh, you have a mirror top. On the mirror, there is a red thread stretched across of it. 
um, on the wall there is a, um, a white thread, with, a black thread with um, white pins, and you have the reflection. Again, taking symbolism quite seriously. So red is the color of victory, but it's also the color of death. Black is the color of death. Um, the whole thing was um, the colors of the Egyptian flag, although I only realized that uh, retroactively. Uh, this is material for a sculpture commemorating a blind man who became a great writer, opening up an unparalleled world of possibilities to the people of his nation. And you have this uh, monitor playing a film, which is a black screen that goes into white with um, slowly or gradually with, with these colors flashing uh, in between. And this is material for sculpture commemorating a singer whose singing became a source of unity of disparate and often opposing forces. And um, you have this, um, yeah, the image, the black and white and the color, and then you have this um, um, uh, aerial view of a, a sculpture of an aerial view of a city that turns into an elevation. And this is material for sculpture commemorating an economist whose name now marks the streets and squares he once frequented. And it's this vitrine with, um, with uh, all of these objects. And of course, the objects are fictional, like I came up with them. But as I was coming up with them, I imagined them somewhere for his personal use, somewhere for his work, somewhere gifts, and I color-coded them uh, accordingly. And this is material for a sculpture um, um, uh, recalling a, a bygone era of luxury and decadence. And this is material for a sculpture commemorating the life of a soldier who died defending his nation against intruding enemies. And to come up with this, I kind of base it on an imagined diary of a soldier. So um, um, there is, you have the four sculptures, but you also have a book, which is a blank book on a shelf with, uh, with, four, with color inserts. And I had uh, come, you know, imagined, um, I come up with an imagined uh, diary of a soldier, but also come up with uh, four uh, statements, like we lost many lives that day, or it was a day of constant bombing. And based on each statement, I came up with a color uh, and the form. Uh, and this is material for sculpture representing a monument erected in the spirit of defiance um, of a larger power. Um, so this is the whole series, and I wanted to run you through the whole series. I'm sorry if it was a bit boring, but I just wanted to give you a sense of uh, how important the language uh, was when it came to describing these monuments, because this, uh, this was kind of an important work, because it allowed me to figure out a few things. One was my own relationship to language, which had always been present, but at the same time, um, I, I didn't... I couldn't really qualify it, but it became very clear to me that, um, uh, let's say, text or words or language were uh, very similar or, uh, to me in terms of how I think of them and how I treat them to, let's, to other forms. Uh, and that language was not there to describe, like, it's not like the text describes um, uh, sculpture or describes an object or the object kind of relies on the text for its description. Uh, but also that, um, you know, when I was using these terms, I was fetishizing every single word that went into them, and it was very clear to me that I couldn't replace them easily. It's not like I could take out a word and, and put in another one. Um, and also that uh, there are certain terms I felt I couldn't use. And this idea of why I couldn't use them became kind of interesting. Um, and one of the ideas was that because I didn't know what they referenced. Like, uh, for example, I think um, uh, a year or during when I was working on this, I made the work titled The Revolutionary because one of the terms that kept coming up when I was working on these monuments was the term The Revolutionary, but I couldn't put it in any of the descriptions because I felt I didn't know uh, what it referenced. Um, so I, I actually made the work, which was um, based on trying to figure out um, what, this, um, what this word uh, referenced. I won't play because I don't think we have um, enough time. We're, I don't know how. Yeah. Okay, so I'll play it. It's like five minutes um, long. And then. As a young man, he was described as an intruder, always jumping from house to house, muddling in his neighbor's business. Those who knew him later in life would have a hard time believing that the soft-spoken, quiet and antisocial man they came to love and respect so much 
was a talkative child, a social butterfly. But perhaps it was these traits, these actions that allowed him to become who he later was. For it was not his love of people or social needs that drove him. On the contrary, he engaged those around him in a systematic effort to gather information, to remain up to date with the matters of his neighborhood, to come to know and understand the thoughts, secrets and habits of those surrounding him. Throughout his life he would say that he never cared if what he heard was true or false. It is the rumors, the gossip, the lies, the made-up stories, the jokes and bitter expressions that truly interest me. One felt he wanted, perhaps more accurately needed recognition. Funny, considering how quiet he was. But then again, maybe it was this silence. This failure to introduce himself to others that made his presence all the more effective. Yes, he was a man in love with himself. But it was not the love that comes from hidden insecurities and constant self-doubt, but the one based on a true understanding of oneself and the world, an understanding that was constantly being tested only to confirm to him time and again that yes, he deserved to be loved. He left his home as a young man. He's lived in 17 cities and visited tens if not hundreds of towns and villages. One would expect that he left a mark wherever he went, but that rarely was the case. For aside from a few locations he was largely unnoticed. His close associates held him in high esteem many coining him as the single most influential figure they knew. Yes, they were transformed by him. But for the rest of the inhabitants of the towns, the cities in which he resided, for the neighbors who shared his buildings, the men and women that ran the shops and grocery stores he frequented, he was never there. He was described as a believer, one who believed in the cause. Some accused him of blind ideology. But all agreed that he was capable of judgment. The kind of judgment that threw empathy out the door. Isn't that the case with all pragmatic men, all leaders of great causes? No, not with him. It was something else with him. For his cold judgment was not tactical but emotional and what he did was not driven by reason that justifies means for an end, but by an anger that drives one to make decisions that harm oneself and very likely one's cause, the kind that plague their owner with regret. Yet he had no regret. He understood that he was a romantic and it was from there that he drew his strength. He had one sister he often talked about, they said it was she who truly raised him. She was much older, never married, read history books and could hold her ground firmly in any discussion involving contemporary politics. He learned the love of books from her, and it was she who introduced him to the people writers and historical figures that came to shape his life. He had few friends, some remarked he was paranoid, distrustful, Yet his demeanor was always calm, confident and charming. In many ways he was a normal man. He had a wife, a family. He seemed susceptible to women, yet if he was unfaithful he knew how to hide it. He was idolized by his sons, his parents, his wife, even her family. As a student he failed to attract much attention, he barely talked in lectures or participated in discussions. Which meant that even though he was always at the top of his class few professors would remember him. He studied agriculture, a strange choice for someone who grew up in the city and never intended to leave as he loudly proclaimed to his family over and over again. When he told his mother he wanted to study agriculture, she was disappointed. I had always imagined a lawyer, a doctor. I didn't think I would be raising a farmer. Plus what do you learn in school? 
This is a hands-on profession. What would you like to become when you grow up? A journalist he would answer quickly and without hesitation. So I study agriculture. Why not journalism, history or even politics? How can agriculture help a journalist who intends to never leave his city? To this he would smile at his mother, a sweet smile. The smile that would never fail to disarm the harshest of his enemies in the future. Yes, the same one that would later become his most memorable trait. Um, yeah, so, um, so that was um, a work done uh, in 2010, and, um, and it kind of opened both, both this work, uh, The Revolutionary, and uh, the series material, it kind of opened this, uh, this, uh, to me this whole idea of um, uh, that if, you know, if there, in language there are terms that seem to, to lack this uh, clear reference that an artwork or making an artwork would be the place where you can kind of locate um, this reference. Uh, and part of the reason why uh, I thought this would be the case, because I feel like in, in fiction and artwork you have this leeway, like you can point to a chair and you can call it a table, and the viewer might go with you. They would entertain the possibility, which you, you wouldn't be able to do the same in other, I mean, or less so. Um, um, so this opened up a whole uh, new project where I started to uh, concentrate on terms where I felt I didn't have a clear uh, idea of this uh, term's reference. At the same time, I felt they were pertinent. Um, this, this series um, titled Lexicon, which I'll just show you um, some of it, uh, started in 2012 and um, ended this year. Uh, actually, I made the bulk of it um, this year, 2019. Uh, so I'll just give you an example. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, one of the uh, displays from the series. It's titled like Laboring 2000 uh, Study for 2012, and it's based on uh, an artwork. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's an artwork from the 60s where the artwork had a descriptive relationship to its title, and the title was Laboring. At the same time, I felt the artwork didn't necessarily manifest the term um, in a way I recognized, so I attempted my own kind of, let's say, contemporary remake. And this contemporary remake took uh, both the form of, um, of, in this case, an object based on the term, as well as a description uh, of the original work in my own language. And this is an example. So, like, you, you can see it laboring in 1964, ink and pencil drawing depicts four humans, etc. Um, so I'll just show you some more uh, to give you a sense. Um, this is a Village, um, and uh, it's work from this year, study for 2019. So there is the description of the original work, and then uh, a form um, that I made. So this is resistance study for 2019. Dialogue study for 2019. Uh, monochrome blue on blue study for 2019. And this is probably one of the latest works. I think the earliest work comes from the um, 1910s and the latest is 1994 and this is also a good one because it shows you that um, the project is not about turning uh, figurative uh, artworks into abstract ones. Many of the originals are also uh, abstract so it's not this relationship. Um, this is uh, so monochrome blue on blue. This is the, the form. Uh, it's the cylinder but on the back of the cylinder it's, it's open and actually you have a judge's uh, gavel. Um, uh, this is Road to Damascus, um, a study for 2019, and it's based on the, you know, the term, the biblical term. So Road to Damascus as like a kind of reaching a, a major juncture in, in one's life. Um, and this is the form. I'll skip this one. This text. Carnival, study for 2019. And uh, yeah, they're not all um, objects, so abstraction study for 2019, it's, uh, it's three prints and it's all of the same text, like uh, it's a Walden Thoreau text um, and you have the text 
it kind of faded out the first one, uh, the text uh, the, uh, not faded out in black, and then uh, the third uh, image you have the text partly faded out with the coat highlighted from it, which is, um, uh, it's a quote from this text uh, which says, if a, man, uh, if a man comes to my house with the intention, or if I knew a man is coming to my house with the intention of helping me out, I would run for my life, which Milton Friedman uh, used to always uh, quote from this um, um, phase study for 2019. Anyway, this uh, gives you uh, a sense um, of, um, of the series. There are many, there's like uh, 30... Uh, something um, displays. So perhaps I should um, end here. Or uh, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for talking us through all of that fascinating work. Um, I have a question, I think, that relates a bit more to the earlier projects. Um, and it's about this kind of translation that seems to be happening maybe in your work between, um, so it's from kind of monumental forms to something more approachable, even domestic and playful. So in the um, Skyline series, for example, um, where you're kind of recognizing something familiar, maybe in the unfamiliar, um, and then with the next work, Making Places, you're finding these anchor points in these objects that are kind of everyday or domestic or playful. Um, I love the bucket and the fountain, but and, and the uh, balloon and the hula hoop. And then when you were talking about the material series and finding these alternative materials for memorials, that include, they're, they're very approachable in their scale and sometimes there are domestic objects um, and seem, they seem to be quite intentionally non-monumental. And I didn't know if that's something you would agree with or a strand you see in your work, but this move from something that is monumental either at the level of a skyscraper or, or an urban environment or a, a memorial and then the, the kind of translation of that into something more accessible really struck me. So I wondered if you could say more about that. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I think, uh, y you know, for, for me it wasn't, uh, with this series, uh, it's also important to mention, it's uh, very mon much meant uh, for an exhibition space. So it wasn't, um, like, I never imagined that any of these uh, proposals for monuments would, for example, make it into public space or they would exist as actual replacements. But it was more about opening up this conversation. So I think of them very consciously as displays. Displays meant to, and this is why the idea proposal or, or study is so important that this is not uh, the real thing. This is just uh, a kind of a start to, to conversation. And it's not, even though, um, you know, the forms are highly finished, I, I work on them a long time and they're very well done and so on. Um, I, it's important for me this idea that their status is a provisional status. It's not a conclusive form, it's not a final form, and it's not a placement for the thing itself. Uh, so maybe this is what um, uh, you're referring to. Uh, the scale for me was, um, I mean, in a way, I think um, if you can do some, you know, the, the, the easiest way to do something is for me the way I would, I would want to do it. So um, in many ways, if, uh, if you can evoke the thing you're after with um, one or two elements, then great. Uh, that's uh, that's also how I would um, uh, go for it. Maybe uh, some of the other works um, were uh, existing as um, as more complex forms, and that they didn't have this. Uh, um, 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 let's say <clears throat> it was the thing itself, as opposed to a kind of uh, a maquette. Uh, for the thing, so maybe this is uh, why why you you feel there is a, a, a difference, yeah. Um, provisional status seems to be quite consciously resisting the conventional attributes of a monument that that might be permanent or that might be 
at least we imagine they're permanent um, and resolved. And the provisional nature and the, the idea of a proposal or a materials for um, seemed, yeah, to resist that idea. Yeah. Um, I mean, maybe one other thing I should mention uh, in relationship to this, because, you know, I've uh, also looked at monuments and memorials in previous works, but in a very different capacity. Like, I was thinking of them as structures in the urban space, what they do, how one interacts with them. But I think with this project material, I was really thinking of uh, monuments and memorials in relationship to the subject matter they commemorated. So the relationship of the, you know, the statue to the historical figure this and this is a very specific um, uh, relationship uh, because yeah then this provision in nature becomes um, extremely apparent I, I would agree with you in, in all monuments yeah yeah thanks first of all to Sophia for the invitation and also Imam for that uh, for a rich description of a, an artist's practice um, by contrast <laughs> I'm going to be, I'm very hyper aware now, speaking very much as an academic. Uh, so I have a kind of paper uh, and uh, an argument which is fairly structured, but I think in our discussion afterwards we'll be able to pull out some sort of resonances between them. Um, particularly I was interested to hear about uh, the movements from Cairo to New York to Berlin and so on. One of the things I want to talk about is the changes of perspective that come with movement. So in a way, it's a response to the frontier and form question. So <clears throat> as you can see, I've titled the talk Perspectives on Seeing as Knowing. In some strands of post-colonial theory, an emphasis is placed on announcing one's locus of enunciation. That's basically a fancy way of saying the place from which one speaks. The rationale for this emphasis is a critique on the opposite notion of a completely unsituated knowledge uh, that doesn't even seem to require a knower, uh, an objectivity supposedly free of subjectivity. And I think this is a, a claim that we should always be quite suspicious of. So stressing one's locus of enunciation instead suggests, indeed performs, the idea that knowledge comes from somewhere, that in fact it is placed, and that subjects in particular contexts are always implicated in it. So I'm going to open by saying just a couple of things about the place from which I speak partly because what I want to say tonight is related to this problem of perspectives on the world that struggle to acknowledge that they are exactly that, perspectives. European modernity has been guilty of this at times, so uh, that's a point that might resonate with the uh, uh, exhibition upstairs. So three of my relevant loci of enunciation then. Firstly, as you heard from Sophia, I do speak as a critical theorist within academia who has retained from a first degree in fine art and a few impoverished years, myself as a practicing artist, uh, a keen interest in you know, art and visual culture. Secondly, I do also speak as a practicing psychoanalyst, uh, more or less outside academia, with a clinical as well as, uh, I would say, an ethical and political interest in processes of subject formation. And that's one of the things I want to focus on tonight. And thirdly, I'm also technically an immigrant from outside Europe, insofar as I was born and raised in Jamaica. Not that you could tell that from my accent, but uh, believe me. So hence this opening reference to post-colonial theory and the problem of perspectives on the world that are blind, uh, for example, to their own Eurocentrism. So I'm quite interested in this problem of modernism and Eurocentrism. So now that you've got some idea of where I'm speaking from, uh, what am I going to speak about? Well, I want to speak about how knowledge is connected to the place from which one sees and how art 
is really well placed to show us that. So to do so, I'm actually going to restrict myself to a discussion of a single painting. So unlike Imam's many, many images, I have really one primarily that I'm going to talk about. It's a well-known and much analysed painting, which actually dates all the way back to 1533. So despite this date, I want to use the painting to raise the general issue of art's constitutive role in and critical reflection upon the formation of the specifically modern subject. Now, immediately with this word modern, we encounter the overdetermined nature of that uh, particular signifier. Uh, it's not quite the same as modernity, and it probably shouldn't be conflated with modernism either. So, nonetheless, uh, by any measure, 1533 is evidently a long time before either the industrialization of economic modernity or the appearance of the works and artists that we associate with aesthetic modernism, let alone their coming together, their commingling, arguably in the Bauhaus modernism that we see uh, in the exhibition upstairs. So if you're a, a real stickler for neat periodization, um, you know, you could be forgiven for thinking, well, it's a bit early in the 16th century to be talking about the modern. So to clarify, I'm talking primarily about a genealogy of philosophical modernity, which actually reaches back quite a bit further, uh, yet does bear explicitly on this question of modern subjectivity. So I'm going to be developing a kind of prefigurative parallelism between this painting, which I shall reveal in a moment, uh, on the one hand, and on the other, René Descartes' quite famous philosophy of the cogito, which you will know from that quintessentially modern assertion, I think, therefore I am. You heard this, I think, before. I think, therefore I am. Today, arguably, everybody here, all of us, we're all modern to the extent that we're probably Cartesians, uh, spontaneous Cartesians. We experience ourselves as individuals uh, with a sort of precious, self-conscious interiority. We believe we have a kind of rational autonomy. To that extent, we experience ourselves as Cartesians. It might be as difficult for us to imagine that this modality of selfhood had a, a time and a place of emergence as it would be for a goldfish to recognize the water that it's swimming in. Uh, in other words, it's kind of so familiar and all around us that it's hard to recognize. And yet the amazing thing about the painting I want to focus on is that it can be read as laying bare the structure of this Cartesian subjectivity just over a hundred years before Descartes uh, had even formulated his cogito, which was in a text called Meditations on First Philosophy, uh, which appeared in 1641 in Latin. So I think artists, or probably more specifically their works, uh, are often way ahead of philosophers in this prefigurative way, and also way ahead of psychoanalysts and other people. So what I'm offering tonight is a kind of deep history of the modern subject, which I hope has some relevance for what we subsequently call modernity, modernism, and so on. Okay, I've held you in suspense uh, long enough. Does this work? Yes. So maybe you'd guessed already, the painting I want to discuss uh, is this one. It's The Ambassadors by Hans Holbein the Younger which you might actually have seen uh, in the flesh, so to speak, because it hangs in the National Gallery uh, in London. Actually, can I ask for like a show of hands? Who stood in front of this painting? Oh, loads of you. That's really helpful. <laughs> Maybe we can use that later on in, in the Q&A. Such is the enigmatic nature of this almost life-size double portrait that many, many commentators, uh, from art historians to philosophers, uh, critical theorists, cultural theorists, uh, have written extensively about it. However, I'm going to be privileging the idiosyncratic approach of just one of them, 
uh, namely the French psychoanalyst Jacques Lacan. So Lacan developed a really interesting take on this uh, Holbein painting over four sessions of his 11th seminar, which was entitled Four Fundamental Concepts of Psychoanalysis. So his sort of public seminar that he gave every year. This one was delivered in 1964. It has been translated into English. So for the most part, I'm going to just be un unpacking Lacan's quite difficult approach uh, to this work, which is radically different from that of an art historian. But it does have the merit, since he was an analyst, of kind of zooming in on this issue of modern subjectivity. Yet, in order to open up our discussion further, towards the end, fairly rapidly, uh, of my talk, I'm also going to be adding perspectives, precisely, that Lacan doesn't utilise, uh, which will touch on a kind of colonial worlding of the world that's discernible in the various objects that are depicted on the canvas. So you might have noticed that I've repeated this word perspectives a few times. It's because it seems to me a really uh, useful way in to this issue of art's role in subject formation. The invention of linear perspective in the 15th century owed as much to the science of optics and the mathematics of geometry as it did to the visual arts. And it was intimately bound up with this huge epistemological shift uh, that we call the Renaissance. Precisely as Renaissance man, with a capital M, began to see himself as being at the center of a newly knowable universe, one which he could use his power of reason uh, to control, to master, and to improve in an already quite modern way. Uh, precisely then, uh, a technique, a pictorial technique emerged that both arranged this new world for him and literally gave him a place in front of it, or before it. So, to take the simplest example of single point perspective uh, on the left. So, everybody knows, probably from their school days, um, you know, perspective 101, that for um, perspective to work, for the convergence of parallel lines around uh, a vanishing point to produce this illusion of depth, uh, which we hastily call a, a kind of reality effect, one has to stand opposite, and ideally on uh, eye level, with that vanishing point's location on a, a kind of bisecting horizon line. Uh, and this positioning effect is only redoubled by two-point perspective, so the graphic on the right, in which the intersection of two vanishing points triangulate a zone of subjectivity for the spectator, as if the two-dimensional geometry on the picture plane, the flat picture plane, uh, extends sort of invisibly but also palpably out into the space in front of uh, the picture. In short, linear perspective supports a standpoint on representations of the world by literally pointing out where you should stand. In his influential book, Perspective as Symbolic Form, the emigre art theorist Erwin Panofsky argued that, uh, quote, not only did perspective elevate art to a science, but the subjective visual impression was indeed so far rationalized that this very impression could itself become the foundation for a solidly grounded and yet in an entirely modern sense infinite experiential world. The result was a translation of psychophysiological space into mathematical space. In other words, an objectification of the subjective. Uh, so end of quote. Panofsky's notion of form here has some family resemblance to Lacan's notion of the symbolic order. Yet, Lacan's model of the subject would lead him, I think, to dispute the causality in this quote, which, if you notice, suggests a pre-existing 
psychophysiological space that is only then translated by perspective into this mathematical or mathematized space. Lacan effectively imbricates these two spaces and messes with that causality, and in doing so, adds a twist to the problematic notion of an objectification of the subjective. To explain why, I'll have to go briefly over Lacan's reading of Descartes' Cogito, before then turning to his related discussion of the Holbein painting. So, Lacan fully endorses the historical importance of the Cartesian cogito for philosophical modernity. He even goes so far as to say that without it, Freud would have had no need to invent psychoanalysis um, over two centuries later. Psychoanalysis was a response to the doubting modern subject which questions an other to try to arrive at its own truth. This is basically Descartes' method of radical doubt. Uh, although in uh, Descartes' case, the other that he was questioning was God because there weren't any analysts around for obvious reasons uh, at the time. Yet Lacan fundamentally disagrees uh, with this proof of self-identity that Descartes arrives at, uh, which is this famous, I think, therefore I am. Uh, and actually, if you read the text, Descartes really needs uh, an undeceiving God to try and guarantee that idea, I think, therefore I am. So it's not watertight. For Lacan, this attempt to make thinking and being coincide, I think, therefore I am, is already a response to the fact that the modern subject is divided, incomplete, non-self-identical, thanks to the fact that he's a symbolic animal, that he speaks fundamentally, one that can't help but think and finds just being really hard. Like animals that don't speak manage that much better than we do. They seem to just be, whereas we seem trapped in this problem of thought. For Lacan, there is a different kind of truth inadvertently articulated in the Cartesian cogito, one which demonstrates that the modern ego is in fact alienated from itself precisely as it believes it recognizes itself in its own thoughts. At its simplest, this is the hypothesis of the unconscious. Our thoughts do not belong entirely to us. That's one way of thinking about what the unconscious is. The way Lacan reads the cogito then is on two planes, and we're going to see those two planes echoed in his discussion of the Holbein painting. On one plane, the cogito provides an illusory sense of self that psychoanalysts call the ego, with all of its uh, attendant narcissisms. But on another plane, it also reveals the modern subject to be a kind of empty point of enunciation condemned to question its being via the signifier, so thought, or particularly for Lacan, speech, because it's primordially from the signifier that its being is derived. So there is an I that thinks it thinks and thinks that what it thinks is its own, but there is another I, a subject of the unconscious whose thoughts cut across intention and rationality. So the well-known Freudian slip, you've all heard of those, uh, is already an experience of that. You know, I meant to say this, but something else happened. Language uh, interrupted my intention. Uh, it's also um, relevant to dreams and also the kinds of symptoms that lead people to enter analysis in the first place to come knocking, for example, on my consulting room door. Now, I've gone quite quickly over that. Uh, it has a lot to do with uh, Lacan's mirror stage argument. I don't know if people have heard of that. If they have some passing association with Lacan, that's probably what you know. I haven't got time to develop it now, but if you want, we can come back to it in the Q&A. In any case, it's basically the same argument regarding Descartes that Lacan brings to the Holbein painting uh, behind me. 
except that uh, this artwork already makes the argument for him uh, in visual form. So, now on the painting. On one level, the painting is part of the then, 1533, rather new genre of secular portraiture, which portrayed people as real flesh and blood individuals rather than as, in the Middle Ages, symbols within a Christian allegorical iconography. There is, of course, a political economy to this. The emergence of individual rather than just church patronage partly had to do with the rise of a mercantile class uh, with wealth that was beginning to be seen as private. So that's part also, I think, of the emergence of the modern subject. At any rate, it's widely accepted in the scholarly, scholarly literature that this secular portrait by Holbein depicts the French diplomat Jean de Danteville, uh, who's the figure on the left, and the recently appointed Bishop of Lavore, Georges de Selve, who's the figure on the right. I'm actually not going to say much, anything really about those as individuals, but it's actually relevant, I think, that we can identify them as uh, historically real entities. More relevantly for my argument, we can see, especially I think from the various objects that are organized on the table between the two figures, uh, that this uh, painting uh, does indeed utilize two-point perspective. In the Flemish style, Holbein has also rendered the various surfaces that we can see, so silk, fur, embroidery, tiling, in a meticulous detail that we're tempted to call realist, though probably we shouldn't. The overall impression, I hope you'll agree, is of displayed wealth, uh, cultural refinement, and also intellectual endeavor across the sciences and the arts because of the objects that are arranged on the table between them, as if what is being carefully constructed here is basically uh, you know, a depiction of two Renaissance men. It might not be too flippant uh, although it is quite flippant, to characterize the painting as a kind of Tudor period selfie. Uh, like the selfie, it clearly has a, a sort of broadly um, narcissistic quality about it. Here Lacan makes a parallel. The Cartesian, I think, therefore I am, finds its phenomenological correlate in the visual field in an I see myself seeing myself. So he's making a parallel between the philosophical argument and a kind of perceptual one. One can hope to find this in the mirror, or as in this case, in a commissioned portrait. These two men seem to know and be in command of their place in their world. And the portrait allows them on one level to see themselves seeing themselves in this flattering way. However, for Lacan, this egoic confidence is what he would call imaginary. It's a kind of fantasy, and its purpose is to cover over a more fundamental and troubling truth about modern subjectivity. So this is why Lacan, in the 11th seminar that I mentioned, introduces this conceptual distinction between the look, uh, which seems to confirm the I see myself seeing myself, and on the other hand, what he calls the gaze. So he makes a distinction between the look and the gaze. And the gaze short circuits self-identity. So the look reinforces the ego in its imaginary aspect, representing the Cartesian subject of representation back to itself, so we could say kind of mirroring it. But the gaze is something else altogether, a contingent and much more discomforting experience in which the ego is brought up against what lies within its own blind spot, namely its fundamental emptiness once the coordinates of this imaginary world fall away. The movement initiated by this gaze, which certain art objects can operationalize, is one from seeing to being seen, from picturing to becoming a picture, uh, a picture, moreover, that's seen from all sides by an unlocalizable other. Uh, in this sense, it's quite closely related to the theme of Lacan's uh, seminar in the preceding year, which was anxiety. So there's a connection between the gaze uh, and anxiety. <clears throat> 
we could say that the gaze makes a hole in the phenomenology of vision, a hole which is also an eye that sees you qua subject. That essentially is what happens in Holbein's painting through his very peculiar use of this technical innovation of anamorphosis, uh, which leads to this strange sort of smear or stain across the, the center of the canvas. Uh, that's very bad timing. <laughs> it does, honestly. Um, <clears throat> and what's, I suppose one of the odd things about the painting is, apart from the fact that it's flickering out of existence, <laughs> is uh, actually, even though that's, that anamorphic kind of distortion is right in the center, uh, and it's kind of in your face, in a weird way, it's quite hard to see, which is, I think, interesting. So, as you probably know, anamorphosis involves the point-by-point -point distortion of an image, often by projection along an axis that has to be reversed in order to become legible. Uh, and one of its early adopters was none other than Leonardo da Vinci. So there's something revealingly modern for Lacan uh, in the fact that the very technology that provides a Renaissance man with a new perspective on himself and on his world simultaneously enabled a parallax shift that decentered that same perspective. So Holbein's novel use of anamorphic distortion thus invokes an experience of the gaze by making a step out of our habitual viewpoint. The vanishing point that normally gives the feeling of a, a kind of three-dimensional reality in which we see ourselves and a world that we know suddenly becomes the empty point of our own vanishing as we're pushed into another perspective. Now, a lot of hands went up earlier, so this is no surprise because it sounds like most of you have stood in front of this painting and done this, uh, but obviously you'll know that, you know, if you stand to the right and look diagonally down, of course, uh, what we see is uh, a skull. Now, this has prompted many commentators to make the connection uh, to the primarily Dutch genre of vanitas painting, which often incorporated a memento mori of this kind um, in order to invoke you know, ideas about the transience of life, uh, the inevitability of death, um, the fact uh, of the vanity precisely of material wealth in this life rather than uh, spiritual things in the next, etc. However, rather than subsuming Holbein's invention here to the pre-existing rules of another genre, I personally want to stress its novelty. Uh, Vanitas predominantly involves still life, so this foray into portraiture is already kind of unusual uh, and interesting. But secondly, it rarely, if ever, made use of anamorphosis in this way. I say this because I think we can read Holbein as developing a bit of a critique of the genre of vanitas, which fitted well enough with prevailing Christian doctrines to constitute a kind of false modesty. So, you know, look at my, in fact, quite expensive painting, um, which shows the world how incredibly modest uh, and not vain I am, but also what a good Christian I am. So you, you could argue that uh, vanitas as a genre still has a kind of narcissistic quality, I think. Arguably, the least important thing about the anamorphic distortion here is that when reversed, it produces a, a recognizable skull with, uh, within a well-established genre. For me, the key point of the painting is rather this parallax enacted on knowledge rooted in any egoic point of view. Quite literally, one cannot see both planes in this painting simultaneously. You can't stand in both places at once. So what Lacan would call the imaginary, on the one hand, which is this plane from which we see ourselves and think we know the world, and what he calls the real on the other, which is outside sense and also outside knowledge or symbolization. Okay, so now uh, in closing... I want to step outside the perspective afforded by Lacan, uh, as rich and suggestive as it is. Of course, it's just a perspective. As I mentioned before, I think it's possible to see 
especially in these objects arranged and displayed on, on the table, evidence of an incipient European colonial mindset, which makes us think about the politics of this egoic position when writ large, uh, and thus the value of Holbein's anamorphic uh, intervention into it. So, you know, what objects do we find when we look closely at the canvas? Well, apart from a, a book of Lutheran psalms, a half-hidden crucifix, and a lyre with an enigmatically broken string, we find a lot of scientific and mathematical instruments. Uh, and these are partly there to sort of semiotically connote the uh, learning, the learned status of these ambassadors as Renaissance men. So here are some of the things we can see. There's a quadrant... There are three types of sundial, a shepherd's dial, a polyhedral sundial, and a disassembled universal armillary. There's something called a torquetum, which I had to look up, uh, which is an astronomical instrument. Don't ask me what it does or how it works. And also, uh, finally, uh, two globes. So one celestial, one terrestrial. Historians of material culture have had a great deal to say about each of these objects, but I really just want to make a, a very general point, which is that they spell out a link between the mathematization of space involved in perspective and the cartographic project of rationally mapping an expanding global space, already for purposes of trade, as we can see from the inclusion of another book, which is actually a little treatise on commercial arithmetic. The problem of longitude and latitude wouldn't be solved until the sort of 18th century, but you get a feeling of the urgency of that question from uh, these objects already. Science and mathematics were not at all neutral, unsituated forms of knowledge then, but thoroughly implicated in what I earlier described as a colonial worlding of the world which was inextricably linked to a particular world view with a particular model of the subject at its centre. The universalism of capital M man, of course, hid its very European locus of enunciation in an appeal to a very transcendental, decontextualised, abstract subject. That's basically what ideology does. It suppresses its locus of enunciation to make universal truth claims. So the power of Holbein's gesture, already in 1533, don't forget, is to decentralize this perspective, opening up other perspectives that arguably help to puncture a certain very early modern European geopolitical imaginary, whilst opening up a more generic and therefore inclusive cosmopolitanism, which can endure more than one point of view, one would hope. So I'm going to end on that optimistic notion uh, in the hope that I've, uh, yes, provided a few perspectives for our discussion. So thank you. so much, uh, Colin and Iman, for this, for this wonderful presentation. Um, sorry, at the beginning, I was sort of running out of breath, and I feel much, much more quiet now. Um, I thought it was quite interesting, sort of uh, speaking about the resonances between the two presentations. Um, both of your interests in language, of course, Iman, with uh, sort of how your three-dimensional objects come to function as images, but also as speech acts. And it seems sort of that came out very strongly. And Colin with uh, the kind of relationship between um, the possibility of knowledge always being embedded in, the, in, in, the, in language and in the fact that it, it, the interplay of meanings constantly fractures our idea of self. And I was wondering if you could both sort of comment in, in order to kind of open the discussion, if you could comment on this idea of enunciation and versus statement or speech act. Mm -hmm. 
I'm, I'm happy to yeah. jump in uh, since I guess enunciation was my uh, term that I threw into the mix. Um, I mean, so one of the things that, for example, Lacan does is make a distinction between the enunciated and enunciation. So the enunciated will be the referent of a statement. And that's where we think we understand or we know. But you will always pull it back to enunciation, which is the process of saying that involves a body and a place and desire and those sorts of questions. So that distinction, you can tell, maps onto some of the things I said about the two planes, in a way, um, the kind of imaginary and what Lacan would think of as the symbolic. And I, I picked up on a point that you made, Imam, which was really uh, precise and seemed to echo a lot of what I was saying. You said uh, art coming to the place where a word doesn't have a reference. So there was some idea in your creative um, motivation to zoom in on the place where there is a word but there is not a referent. So for me, that's what's opened up in the gap between enunciated and enunciation is the possibility of some kind of creation. Because in the end, if it was just a case of enunciated and references or reference, we would just have a, a very concrete type of language where we just understood everything everybody was saying and then where would art be or poetry or all of those things we value so much so for me it's about that gap uh, between the two which is precisely where as you said art finds a place makes something of Um, yeah, I, re I relate uh, very much uh, to this um, uh, last statement um, you mentioned. Um, I, I think for me it's important to mention that I also don't think of, um, let's say, a three-dimensional form and the, the text as, as very different. Like, um, Of course, I know they're structurally very different. Like, What a photograph does is structurally very different than what a sculpture does, than what a text does. But actually, in my approach, uh, I approach them all as language, with with this idea that they are structurally different. So they probably do different; they have different capacities. But the the language is, um, I would extend it to all of them, um, and that's why um, I've also come to be very uncomfortable with the term object, because I don't believe that's what I'm interested in, or be, it comes up a lot in my work. I mean, it's also these things that, you, it's not the language I usually use, or if I use it, it's, it's like a, as part of a display. But um, this, this kind of obsession with, uh, with objects, which uh, I actually don't have, because for me, the text that you know, that like, let's say, a three-dimensional form that exists, the kind of spatial configuration, they're all collaborating in order to aim at something which itself might not be present in this space. So it's not about um, this kind of idea of demystifying the object or, or kind of reconfiguring it and giving it uh, um, uh, different um, elements. And I think, you know, like, I, I actually started working on a new project now when I'm thinking about uh, film sequences uh, in relationship to spatial elements in space. But the only reason, actually, I went to um, to film because, and I think it has to do with this idea of, um, you know, instead of an object thinking of a thing and a thing as something like, um, you know, in cinematic language, it's never stable enough to be, you know, it's constantly changing and there's an idea of a whole, but the whole is never ever given. So, it, you know, so can you capture... Um, can you speak of like things in that manner where they're constantly uh, fluid? Um, which I think also relates to what you were saying about um, language. I mean, this, uh, because for me, there is uh, the, uh, there feels to be a kind of uh, urgency or need to do this um, because of the kind of... Um, I think we're also at a moment now when so many things are contested that we might assume that everything has this very stable f 
thing, like an object is a stable thing and it's, it's meant to, you know, evoke, like, let's say, this uh, this historical violence. But, but in truth, I, I wonder if things ever have this kind of stability that... Um, that uh, seem to be uh, such a, a main part of current discourse. In response to that, with my Lacanian ear, when you said whole, I presume it was with a W, yeah, yeah. and I heard it with an H, which yeah. is interesting. Because <laughs> in a way, it's exactly that problem, that object implies a kind of knowable, ontological fullness that's rather fixed. And so that's an object that exists in reality. But the point I think you're making is a really important one. Uh, for us, they don't exist like that uh, because they're entangled in social meanings, sort of broadly linguistic systems that make us relate to them already in a way that's not objective, it's subjective. So that's partly why I was trying to bring out what I find valuable in, in Lacan's intervention, which is to mess with that sort of assumed uh, topology of an inside, like a psychological interior and some kind of empirical or ontological fixed exterior. Actually, what he's doing is really twisting that in a complicated way. That's partly what I was trying to say with those objects. It's not that they're objects it's already part of a worlding which is material but also symbolic and subjective all at once. I just, I just tie it back to uh, the context of, uh, of the form and the frontier is exactly this sort of worlding that is consubstantiated um, by the idea of this fixed reality that exists outside. Um, of, of, um, of the possibility of, of knowing uh, that permits and, and sort of um, legitimizes the kind of state violence that continues to persist today. Um, I was wondering if maybe there's some questions from the audience. There's two floating mics, one on each side. This one there. Um, oh God. Uh, I was curious about the note that you ended on uh, with the rather optimistic um, you know, tinge to it and thinking about the idea of co-welding um, when 100, maybe 200 years later, but around then, um, there was the idea of denying certain ontologies when it came to conflicting with this, uh, you know, the, the, the project of rational enlightenment in colonies, right? Uh, the idea that anything that was pre-rational, or, or something that was seen as pre-rational, superstitious, so on and so forth, uh, which I think a lot of colonial, well, decolonial theorists have dealt with, Ashish Nandi for one, um, being unable to withstand, the, the, the European Renaissance man being unable to withstand the notion of something that was pre-rational. Um, I'm wondering what you have to say about that being classified as a historical um, very often thinking of the colonial subject or as, as primitive or ahistorical because they didn't conform to these ideas of mathematical precision and mapping um, through the rational project. Um, wondering what you might have to say about that. Yeah, so I guess what you've teased out there is uh, one element of that worlding that I was talking about, which is that one of the rather specific things I think about the, the European version of that is uh, a certain version of time which is linked to uh, assumptions or assertions about progress, which tends to imply a kind of line going up, a teleological line going up, and we call it progress. We're here at the top. Unfortunately, you're at the bottom, uh, but through development discourse, we can help you catch up, etc. Right. So that's a very strong kind of argument. And it's true that um, part of philosophical modernity is a strong distinction between the rational and the non-rational and it plays its part in that teleological argument uh, because I mean it's older than that you could go back to kind of um, I don't know the Greeks and barbarians there's a notion of civilization that has long made that distinction 
but certainly with the Enlightenment, it becomes quite specifically around rationality. Um, just as a sort of counter to that, I don't know if people know uh, Bruno Latour's uh, text, uh, We Were Never Modern, I think it's called. Uh, he makes some interesting points there about um, how, again, this same strand of kind of European modernity asserted a strong distinction between, uh, if you like, the social and nature. And he rightly recognises that that version of reason separated from nature is landing us in all sorts of problems, including, I mean, the most obvious, you know, we have... Uh, Extinction Rebellion as a backdrop here. We can't think properly about what's happening because we think about it through this distinction between uh, the social, social rationality and nature. So what we really need to do is push beyond that. And so he talks about, um, it's a nice phrase, a parliament of things, which is a way of saying, actually what you were saying in memory about objects and trying not to accept them as distinct objects also of knowledge so one of the things we need to do is try and push past that um, set of distinctions that make us misperceive what's happening in the world and I think in that would also be that problem of teleology and progress and rationality thank you Just to sort of add a note, there's another question there, but there's, um, on the note of Latour's, we've never been modern, uh, there's this beautiful image of uh, a parliament of animals that is split in the middle, is is an Ethiopian painting now, I can't recall the date, but uh, where you have the sort of animal speaking and accessing language and sort of taking the, the decision uh, making process. Uh, and this painting has been sort of used to uh, speak about this precise moment where the border and the frontier between the self and the other and the unconscious mind of the sort of a priori or a historical societies and the European modernity have been separated. And I suppose that even though that's, that was very present in, 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 the idea, in the notion of worlding that you brought about, um, to tie it back to Iman's presentation and also to sort of a text that Iman published recently. I'm quite interested how this idea of, in, how this comes to define the idea of interiority and uh, how the artist is positioned across this torpedo of progress that is modern art history. And just sort of as a reference, this, this torpedo that I'm referring to is, um, is part of an image that uh, Alfred Barr, who was the first director of MoMA, um, sort of used to, to diagram the, the mission and values of the Modern Art Museum. It was sort of torpedoing towards the idea of, um, of losing complete mimeticism and, and losing uh, towards pure expression. Um, so I was wondering if, Iman, maybe you could comment a little bit on this. Yeah, um, <clears throat> no, I mean, this is a, a, a big point um, uh, for me, this idea of uh, interiority, but also like, um, you know, this, I guess you kind of touched on it, also the, the distinction between the subject or the false, let's say, distinction between the subjective and the objective. And uh, I've come to it from working, like what I was saying about working with memory and so on, but, you know, it's interesting, like I have... Um, I had studied philosophy for my undergraduate and I remember reading someone like Henry Bergson and memory actually is not located in the subject at all. Memory exists in the world and the subject goes out and pulls from it as... So even um, this idea of, um, uh, of what... Um, you know, the individual um, artist, what's the subject position you have to inhabit um, as an individual artist. And when I, um, I think the text you're referring to was the one on abstraction. Because abstraction as a, let's say, a form is a kind of an interesting case. Because the forms, if we speak, if we want to speak in terms of the European, non-European, but like the forms uh, of abstraction, 
um, are actually mostly indebted to non-European, let's say, uh, non-Western um, cultures. But the only thing that has really happened was taking these forms and emptying them from, you know, supposedly the functional, uh, the kind of communal, the religious. So all of the, uh, you know, even though the forms did not necessarily change so much, what, what has happened is they become presented as these uh, uh, formal um, experiments located in the individual subject, located in an individual artist expressing um, themselves. So with this text, I was kind of interested in, in other ways to think of that. And so I kind of was looking at um, uh, Kasia Silverman, who writes about uh, Gerard Richter, and uh, and because he, you know, he 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 makes abstract paintings, he makes figurative paintings, and he makes photographs, but he calls them all photograph. Like he says, I'm making a photograph when he's making an abstract uh, painting, and. Um, and also looking at someone like uh, Laruel, where he describes uh, photography as a thinking that n is not necessarily uh, related to a camera. And that actually, uh, you know, if you start to think of the artist um, in, in this way as a thinker whose who's thinking forms, then even though this kind of... Uh, uh, you know things that are uh, presented um, as as a result of uh, subjective effort might have a claim that is not really uh, located in in the personal or or the subjective. And another thinker, of course, who does this um, very strongly is Jalal Taufi, uh, the Lebanese uh, thinker, because he he's also been uh, thinking about this idea of an artist as someone who's able to access. Um, um, uh, uh, forms um, uh, not uh, inability to see things that exist uh, objectively that come uh, through through art, but it's not related necessarily to, um, let's say, the the kind of subjective um, uh, person or or experience of the maker. So yeah, it's it's a it's a very interesting uh, and and big uh, question for me. If I may. Um, is it Jalal Tufik who speaks of uh, the artwork being adjacent to the world? Is I mean, for me, I thought all of them did, but they had different ways because uh, Kaja Silverman speaks of analogy, so like uh, the photograph being uh, analogical to the world, and I always thought of analogy as like, uh, you know, it's, it's an equal relationship, so it's not representation, and it's not uh, a metaphorical relationship. You have two, two, uh, two things, like an art and world next to each other, and then Laruel uses the term parallel, between you know a photograph and the world, which I also think is is kind of an interesting <laughs> spatially. Like uh, it's not one is not um, in any way in a hierarchical relationship to the other. So it's not like the world, and then you have the poor image, the poor copy of it as a photograph. Actually, both are are parallel. And uh, Jaya Tafi, he speaks of artworks as univer universes uh, bordering. Uh, our universe, but are not part of it. So I think it's, it's a similar. For me, all of them have this this idea of a kind of adjacent. Uh, um, uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. I can hear you. I don't think the mic's working, but I can hear yeah, you. Yeah, it's not working. <laughs> Oh, that's better. Is that better? Yeah, oh, yeah. It is, yeah. Um, <laughs> I find this fascinating because so most of you are scientists and then turn to art uh, to look at my own, own uh, two things. First, I looked at the wide environment, but then I began to focus, because I'm Anglo-Indian, historically, um, on, on my personal space and place and uh, memory, identity, etc. So while at St. Martin's, when I started to do my art degree, um, Although I was, in theory, looking, for example, my thesis entitled Light, Memory, and Identity, yet I chose to crashed and burnt out cars in Tottenham as a way of expressing that, which is a strange thing, and my tutor just couldn't see the connection. I tried to explain it to him in a kind of more rational way by saying, well, I've been shiftless in my life. The army has moved me. My parents had no choice where we lived. We were like gypsies. The nearest thing to us would be travelers. <laughs> 
um, and how that's affected my, my identity and then work. And it's only since coming to Nottingham that I've had several shows now looking at um, my Anglo-Indian background. And there's some shows running now at the um, New Art Exchange, which explores that. Um, I'm actually writing parallels between what I'm learning here in the Bauhaus with that particular show. Um, and I'm writing for the local magazine Left Lion on this. So um, I was very much taken by your two points of view uh, in terms of the practicing artist, if you like, looking at it, and you as the psychoanalytical person. Because since then, I've actually undergone psychoanalysis myself and therapy. And I've got a much better view of myself now. But um, I was going to say um, on a wider issue in terms of Bauhaus ideas, how do you reckon that impacts on art practice in the post-colonial world um, and in terms of identity? You know, it may be a related question or totally unrelated, but I find it's causing me to th spin out and think in lo lots of ways. Um, have you got any comments on this as a phenomena? How does the Bauhausian ideas that we're involved in terms of the Bauhaus now impact on postmodern art practice, if you like, in terms of identity, memory, things like that? I'm very much, but I'm just I feel I would say. probably have to defer that to the artist because yeah. I'm not. I mean, sure I just wonder who would be best to do with it, really. But uh, it, it's yeah. a big question. And further questions about how you feel about that. Um, yeah, I mean, the Bauhaus is an interesting phenomenon because you don't really know how to think of it. And I think all these exhibitions happening now with the Centennial all over the world are one way to place to start. But because, I mean, you have the school, you have the ideology, you have the thinking, you have the, you know, the ideas that are uh, clearly influential. And then you have the forms, which have kind of assumed, uh, I mean, the, at the level of style, they've also become just things that uh, that are uh, coated and uh, as as kind of uh, um, uh, pure forms um, I mean one thing that I've noticed um, that maybe I feel a bit uneasy about with the, with with some of the iterations that I've seen in the Bauhaus, not this one, but, uh, but not the one here. But um, I mean, there is uh, you know this idea of uh, of the kind of and maybe it also touches a bit on something you mentioned uh, in your presentation about the universal that, that there is a neutral um, form, and that neutral form, let's say, assumes um, a form which is, I don't know, like a, a very functional chair that's a neutral uh, form. And then when you start to think of the rest of the world, uh, you want to see that um, visibly added to that neutral form. So like uh, we want to speak about the Bauhaus in Japan, we look for what is Japanese. Um, and this I mean, it's presented sometimes as a kind of a, rev a revision of that history, but for me it has a kind of, it's like the premise is a bit um, faulted because the neutral form is, is I mean, is, is not, the neutral form is just, um, it also has a context and, and, uh, and when you speak about, when you start to kind of look for the markers of, of, other, uh, of other cultures, there is something a bit um, essentializing and, and violent that's happening a bit there. So this I've just noticed uh, as an observer, not necessarily as, um, as an artist in some of the revisions, let's say, of that history. Because there is, I mean, I feel like there is a genuine urge and need to kind of revise um, that history because of the moment we're in now. But um, sometimes we maybe we need to go um, to start a bit lower from the premise on, uh, from which we, we start. I, that's my feeling. Mm. The, uh, you will know much better than me, but the Imaginista way of responding to the centenary seems to include an attempt to, um, in a way, recover from the problem of Eurocentrism that I was talking about. Um, and what you mentioned made me think about that sort of core Bauhaus notion of uh, a sort of harmonious marriage between form and function. Uh, that ought to make us wonder <laughs> because of the contextual question. Um, it sounds quite platonic, doesn't it? That there is this form, like the form of a chair. And then 
uh, you come up with a, a design that's for uh, a totally rationalized urban space. And you can hear that there are some kind of issues there. And the Imaginista reimagining seems to include more an emphasis on Bauhaus as part of a sort of transnational cultural flow, which is really a kind of set of um, aesthetics or styles almost. And what seems to have been lost of, for example, some of the kind of organizational questions about how do you run an art school, um, which is an interesting kind of midway point between the two. So yes, you've, you've reminded us that there are pitfalls uh, always with these kind of, a, actually an attempted sort of cosmopolitan reimagining in a way of uh, Bauhaus, which it seems to be part of what's happening with the Imaginista project. I just want to, uh, because of what you said, I mean, I think for me, actually, this, this idea uh, a form of function is something I can understand because it's an idea, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a concept that you can think about and you can contest. I mean, you can, uh, we can talk about, you know, is this table just purely structural or does it have uh, additional elements? But when that becomes equal to uh, Western or European, when that f an idea that is actually an idea that many ideas exist in the world, and then um, anything that departs from that um, idea becomes added as a regional content, then you have a problem. So I, I have no problem with the idea of form well, and although, function. Although I suppose if we push it far enough, you don't have to go to some exotic other place to wonder about that form and function marriage. So I was instantly thinking about a kind of inherent sort of ableism built into what function is. So if you, you have disabilities, then a chair is not just a, a perfect form that meets your functional needs. So I think it's a, a, yeah, a big question. Mm -hmm. I think just to add, um, there's this sort of interesting idea, um, not relating to, to, to the Bauhaus directly, but I, I was thinking as you were speaking about a particular series of paintings called Hostages by Art and Language, and how uh, sort of what, what is, so the, the, the paintings that they've been doing for about 40, four decades now, um, there's added layers of paint, of meaning, of drawing, constantly on one on top of the other um, to the point where it's impossible to perceive what's the, the original idea. Um, of course, if we move into debates about conceptual art, then it becomes much more complicated um, to, to relay the idea of form and function. Um, but there's certainly, I think, um, in your practice, as you were talking about these earlier examples and you were talking about revisiting these forms of the past, and revisiting perhaps of, um, forms that were coming from your memory, uh, there's also an idea of giving them a function in the present, right? Even if that function is not able or capable or sort of um, within that embodied ableism that you were talking about, Colin. Um, and I think that within the Bauhaus Imaginista project, although I cannot speak for them, of course, um, there is certainly an inherent idea of critique in the name. There is uh, the imaginist and is also proposing a revision of that which is read as a cohesive and consolidated European movement. Uh, I think that there is an attempt to to read it, of course, transnationally and and through the global movement of Bauhaus Immigres, um, but also really sort of putting. Uh, or turning the head onto what we believe is European modernism as a kind of hegemonic narrative. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's um, within sort of modernism studies as an academic field. I think that's been work that's been going on for some time, partly because of post colonial critiques as well. But just to get to the root of the notion of either, yes, it comes back in a way to what you were saying about objects. You know, Europe has never just been Europe. Modernism has never been locatable there. So to, you know, um, 
So, for example, strands of postcolonial theory have spoken about modernities, so pluralizing, or um, vernacular modernisms in non-European spaces to just sort of fracture that sort of um, very located uh, teleological narrative um, that we were all familiar with. Perhaps if there's one last question to close the session, there's one here. And then another one there. Thank you. To go back to the start of your talk, could you, could you expand a little bit when you use the word monument or monument, uh, what are you thinking? Um, monument? Is that, that's what you, uh, yeah. Um, I was, I mean, I've, I think I mentioned before, I worked um, quite a bit on, on monuments um, in different capacities. So even um, from in other work that I didn't show, I was um, uh, thinking about what the monument's uh, relationship to the urban space in which it exists, what uh, that structure does. Uh, but in the work I mentioned, I was um, thinking literally of monuments and memorials, so statues and um, and the structures that were built to commemorate um, historical events and figures and and, uh, and spaces. Yeah. Was there another question? No. Okay. Um, well, question there. Hello. Um, I was wondering whether in the picture of the ambassadors, whether it could be looked upon as being um, uh, an early example of product placement, where you have um, these two gentlemen surrounded by uh, various materials and contraptions from uh, the Renaissance of their era, and whether the picture is um, giving these... Um, objects which are possibly patented, whether it's giving these objects um, uh, advertising space to encourage their sale. <laughs> A very interesting idea. Um, although I think, you know, I, I mentioned even with realism the danger of sort of historical retrofitting. Um, so w one of the first things I thought about is product. Um, they're not really commodities, I don't think. They seem to have uh, a value linked to these um, ideas around intellectual endeavor that I mentioned, which is a different sort of value system, I think. But what's interesting is that it's right on the cusp of exactly what you're talking about as well. Um, so there's some very detailed scholarship on the kind of... Um, yeah, the sort of material history of those objects. Because Holbein, you know, depicted them accurately enough that people have tracked down which uh, terrestrial globe that was, who manufactured it, which one was it, when, and they, they were uh, products, you know, bought and sold. Um, and in a way the same for some of the other objects. So it's kind of on the, the cusp moment of the emergence of that, but at least in this picture, in this painting, they seem to be present for different reasons than kind of product placement. And obviously advertising space, uh, it's a canvas that hung initially in uh, the chateau, presumably, of one of those figures. Uh, not for public viewing, so it's quite rubbish from an advertising point of view in terms of reaching much of an audience. Uh, now, of course, we're actually mostly very familiar with it, so retrospectively we can say it would have been a smart ad campaign. <laughs> um, but yeah, thanks, that's a really interesting perspective. Thank you. And perhaps on this note, you could join me in thanking our speakers and also yourselves. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, again, we have uh, an upcoming event with the Autolith Group.
uh, exploring Kala Bhavan, which is a school in India, uh, began by Rabindra Tagore, who, which inspired very much the, the Bauhaus. And in the beginning of November, we'll have the conference Architectures of Education. So there'll be plenty of opportunities to continue dialogue um, and hope to see you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you.